In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Welcome back to my home. So glad to see you. Before I begin, I want to point out behind me the beautiful pastels from Penny, and you can see one of my two icons. I travel with them. I feel like Rebecca, she traveled with her household gods. I travel with my icons everywhere I go. Something new. Do you see the flowers? Vicki Chan made them. I told her I was going to tell everyone what she did. They are so beautiful. And she said, well, if you learn how to make them, they will make you happy. And I said, well, if you teach me how to make them, I might do that. But boy, I, I have no idea how you went about doing that. Beautiful work. Isn't that wonderful? So today, I want to talk about what it is to accept that Christ is in the world. I want to talk about how important our worldview is, what worldview that we truly carry in our hearts. And one way that I know of its importance is really a sad story. It's true. I had two friends, they were in their 60s by the time I knew them, a brother and a sister. They had gone to the same high school, they had the very same high school history teacher. And this history teacher had a worldview that he shared with them. It was like, we know the Nicene Creed, he would say this one thing over and over again. I don't have it memorized, thank God, but they did. And it was something like this, he would say, the world is a cruel and harsh and cold place. It's competitive. You have to fight for everything you get. And they could say it with feeling. And they had taken that into their worldview. And I would say that it misshapen them. It made it hard for them to trust life, to trust people. Our worldview is so important. And in the Old Testament lesson, the Pharaoh shares that very worldview. He sees the world as a harsh, cold, competitive place where you've got to fight for what you want. And now the time is generations after Joseph when he invited his family and other Hebrews to live in Egypt, it's a long time after the Pharaoh who welcomed these Hebrew people. And so this Pharaoh is looking at the population of Hebrews and he's very afraid. He's afraid they're going to take over and he will lose his position. And so you read in this story how he tries various ways to control them, to discourage them, to keep them from being such a large force in the country. Nothing works. And so finally, he calls two midwives, the main midwives for the Hebrew pregnant women. Shifra and Puah are their names. He says to them, when a child is born to a Hebrew woman, if it is a female, I want you to let that child live. If it is a male, I want you to kill it. And imagine a midwife is their calling is to nurture life, new life in the world. They did not do that. They were not about to go against what they were called to do. And so in a very sneaky way, brilliant way, they got away with it. They did not hurt one little child. They helped them all thrive. And the story continues, but that worldview is what I want to bring up to us because that's also the worldview when in Jesus time and it was hard for the Israelites they were a colony of the Roman Empire they were less than the Romans it was a cruel and hard world and into that worldview into that world situation came Jesus, a God for us, God. And where Jesus was, things changed. There was healing, there was compassion, there was forgiveness, there was acceptance of the unacceptable, 
there were miracles, there was feeding, and people were struggling. Let us understand, what is this? What is in our midst? And Jesus asked his disciples, what do people say I am? Clearly people had been struggling to understand this God force. And so the disciples answered, they say, one of the great prophets, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, John the Baptist. And Jesus pushed a little farther and he said, and who do you say I am? And Peter gets it in a flash, he gets it. You're the Messiah, you're the Christ, you are the son of God. And he answers two things, one thing, tell no one. Why would he say that? I suggest there are two reasons and one is, I learned this from Rudolf Steiner, a great teacher in the mid 1900s. He said, when you're sharing something important, always measure the readiness of the people you're talking to. And if they are not ready for very much, then share general information with them. If they're farther down the road, share even more. And we see that often in the gospels, Jesus will share more with his disciples. Another reason, think about it, when, when something important has shifted in your life, if you know about it, but you hold it in your heart, you don't talk about it just yet. It's like it continues a conversation in your heart. It's like it grows. It's like when Mary took in godness in her life and the baby Jesus was being formed. And she was aware of that new life. It's like that. It's like something grows inside of us and it helps to let that grow at first in peace. And what is it that grows? What is it to say that Jesus is Christ? Well, I'll tell you what three wise people have said. C.S. Lewis, who is that great writer from the 20th century, he said, here's what it's not. He said, I, I'm trying to prevent anyone from saying that really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. They say, I'm ready, ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I do not accept his claim to be God. He said, that's one that we must not say. A man who is merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He might be a lunatic, such as someone who comes up to you and says, I'm a poached egg. Or worse, he might be of the devil, claiming to be God. He said, you've got a choice. Either this man and is the son of God, or else he is a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit on him. You can kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet. You can call him Lord and God. But let us never come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He did not even leave that option for us. He did not intend to. He is either God or a lunatic or something worse. Make our choice. So what is that reality then? And I want to tell you what a, a wise clergyman wrote. He said, Christ is not just a person. Christ is not just a title, and it's certainly not the last name of Jesus, Jesus Christ. He said it's more like an explosion of a star. His presence on earth was like an explosion of godness in the earth. When a star explodes, out of that come planets, come shifts of life. He said the explosion of godness in our world that came through Jesus' presence, it is still changing lives today. How does that happen? Here's what Thomas Burton wrote about it. He said, Jesus is like a great magnifying glass. Through Jesus, the light of God came to the world in such a concentrated 
and beautiful way that when we place our dry, our brittle souls under that magnifying glass of the light of God, it's as though twigs are ignited by that concentrated light and a fire begins in our lives. And we need that fire, don't we? We need that real worldview to be what we live by. We've always needed that. We always have struggled with anxiety and guilt and fear. But now with COVID, don't we understand we need it even more to understand that Christ is here, even in this COVID. And it changes how we see things and it changes how we see life, and it changes how we see each other. And I want to tell you one way I understand this. It's about a story that has been going around forever and ever. It's an ancient rabbi. He's teaching his students, and you know the Jewish way. You ask a question, and they answer, and you push back, and they, you know, back and forth. So he said to his students, it has been night for a long time, and now finally daylight is coming. How do you know that daybreak is here? And one student said, Rabbi, I think we know daybreak is here when we look at the trees and we can tell a difference between an apple tree and a pear tree. Then we know it's daybreak. He said, that's a good answer. It's not the right one, though. Anyone else? And someone else said, Rabbi, when we're walking down a road at night and we see an animal coming toward us and we can tell the difference between a dog and a fox, then we know it's daybreak. He said, that's a good answer. It's not right. Anyone else? And he waited. No one else ventured forth an answer, he said. When we look up, out of the darkness, we can make out a face in front of us, a human face. When we can see that face and see, that person is my sister. That person is my brother. Then the light of God is coming into our night. And we who follow Christ, Say it this way, when I look at you, when I look at any human being, and I say, you are Christ in front of me, then God light has come into my night. It is the complete opposite worldview of what the Pharaoh had. The Pharaoh invited those midwives, Shifra, who are to dismiss the value of human life based on race. Aren't we invited to dismiss the value of humans based on their race, based on their political views? We must never, said Paul, dismiss anyone. We must instead see that all of us are part of one body, all of us are part of one family of God. When we do that, we are bringing God into this world. There is a writer, he's an Italian writer named Ignacio Silone. He wrote, when we are able to treat other humans the way Jesus treated humans, it is as though Jesus never left our world. Sister Teresa Bavala said the very, very same thing in different words. She said, you and I, she said, we are now the arms of Christ in the world, the legs of Christ in the world. There's a beautiful card. They sell it at Holy Cross Monastery. It's a quotation by Meister Eckhart. He said, we are all called to be mothers of God in this world. We are called to bear. Christ into this world. Aren't we called to do that? 
Aren't we called to be the midwives who protect precious Christ's life in this world? It is easy to say the Nicene Creed, isn't it? It's easy to say, oh, you're the Christ, you're the Messiah. But to take that reality, to trust it, is to trust that love is at the basis of this world, even this world that suffers COVID-19. We are called to be those Christ bearers. We are. Then we are bringing Christ into our world. <laughs>